We're holding Mishlei Sefer, Mishlei Perek Gimel, third chapter, and we left off at Pasuk Yud Aleph, so 11. Towards the middle and the end of the chapter, you will notice that Shlomo Melech will repeat various concepts that are familiar to us from the past that we've discussed. But any time he repeats something, there's a new dimension to it. He's coming to emphasize perhaps the same idea from a different angle, and there is great importance for this. Because as we will see, it is emphasized throughout the whole Sefer of Mishle that our life as a whole is one big lesson. As we go through life, the many stages in our life, we learn a lot. It would be better if we were prepared if we started off our life knowing many of these things so we, don't, we shouldn't have to learn from our mistakes. Because life is full of lessons. And as we will see, there are many lessons to be learned, things that we would not understand on our own unless we have the Torah to guide us to interpret what this or that means. So he begins by saying, Musar Adonai Beni Altim As. Do not despise the Musar. The Musar means the rebuke, the ch- chastening. Neither should you uh, be unhappy with, here it's translated as, do not be wary of his correction. But it's the same idea of not despising any Musar or any Tochacha, any rebuke that HaKadosh Baruch Hu rebukes us or reprimands us. Now what is he talking about over here? When does HaKadosh Baruch Hu rebuke us? He's talking about specifically about something called Yesurim, pain and suffering that people go through in life. There are various forms of pain and suffering, whether it's disease, whether it's falling down, slipping, whether it's a car accident, whether it's being hit over the head. All of these are different forms of Yesurim, and all of this is called Musar Hashem or Tochacha. And what is the difference between Musar and Tochacha? Musar is much more powerful. It comes and it goes. Tochacha could be much more steady, much more regular. It's an easier form of rebuke. Nevertheless, they both have something in common. They are intended to awaken us, bring us to our senses, that something that we're doing is wrong. And therefore, these two are very important. Because they are the ones that help us with direction. In case we went off the derech, in case we're making a mistake, they're necessary to put us back on track. As long as, of course, we pay attention, as long as we we do as we're instructed to do. They are therefore out there to help us. Therefore, Shlomo continues on to say, that this package that's called Tochacha in Musar is not just for anyone. Who does Hashem send these packages of Yesurim to? For he who Hashem loves, he will correct, like a father does with his son in whom he delights. That's the translation. In other words, Yesurim does not come to just anyone. Yesurim is an indication of a certain relationship that Hashem has with the individual. He cares about that individual. And that is why, believe it or not, he is sending him Yisurim. We're used to the opposite. If somebody hurts us, he doesn't like us. Shalomah Melech is telling us it's not so with Hashem. Pain and suffering do not come on their own. It, does, it just doesn't happen by itself. As we will see later on, everything is Bashgaha. We're told this all along in the Sefer. We're told this in the Torah. That Kadosh Baruch Hu, through His divine providence, controls everything, especially with the Jewish nation, on an individual basis. Nothing happens randomly or haphazardly. Everything is bashgacha. He's aware, he's in control, and he dictates. And this is extremely important when we're dealing with something so enigmatic, perhaps, and so painful as disease. When our dear ones suffer, or when we ourselves are going through many troubles, and we're trying to figure out what is this for, what did I do wrong? especially those who didn't do anything wrong. They are really puzzled by what's going on. So number one lesson about pain and suffering is it happens to those that Hashem loves and cares about the most. 
very important statement, especially to those who are going through this. You mean Hashem really loves me? He really cares about me? Then why is He doing this to me? Well, He has a relationship with us. It's like a relationship between a father and a son, a father and his child. When a father loves his child, he wants to correct the child. When the child is wrong, when the child misbehaves, does a father hate his child? When the father rebukes his child, slaps him, does he hate him? No. Hopefully the father is in control and is not abusive either. But even if he were to be harsh, he never does it out of enmity, God forbid, for the child. I mean, he, every normal father, I mean, there are people who are not normal, but every normal father loves his child, no matter how bad the child is. And when he rebukes him, he attempts to correct his mistakes, attempts to show him the right way. And Hashem has that relationship with Am Yisrael, with the Jewish nation. In this Pasuk, we have received a partial explanation of why Tzadik Veralon Rasha Betovlo, the famous subject of why the righteous suffer and the wicked prosper. Famous philosophical question, and we can give a whole lecture just about that, and we can never fully comprehend or fully understand the whole subject or why things happen to, to, to people, but we do know that there's a reason for it, and we do know that there's a partial answer here, that it's as a result, as a result of the relationship that Hashem has with us, and it because of His concern. And for those who is concerned the most, He takes care of their problems immediately, in this world, preferably. And that is the part, partially the explanation of why Yesurim come about. This, the Yisurim are a form of Musar or a Tochacha that is intended for a person to awaken and to examine his deeds as the Rabbis tell us. He should examine himself why are these things happening. And why do they happen? Because Akadosh Baruch Hu wants to remove any stain committed by the Anavon, by sin, preferably in this world. So when the Neshama, the soul goes upstairs, it, it is clean. You're better off going to the laundromat here than having all your laundry taken care of over there. That is a simple explanation of what Yisurim is, regardless of the severity, whether it's hurting your pinky, tripping on the floor, slipping on a banana peel. It makes no difference. Anything that is hurt that hurts is called Yisurim. And if it's Yisurim, and Yisurim Beli Avon. There's no such thing as a per- someone going through some form of pain without there being some guilt somewhere. That is how much we believe in the complete Hashgacha of Hashem, that no one suffers for no reason. We may, not, we may never know all the reasons. It is a very complex topic of why things happen to people who appear to us to be great people. And I don't want to get off the subject, you know, we're learning Mishlei, but this is a whole subject in itself that we've covered many, many years ago, that Hashem will cover it again, of what are the various possibilities to explain why certain people are going through some situation, whether it's in the area of their livelihood, having a hard time making ends meet, whether it's in, in the area of children, they can't seem to be having children. They've been living with, you know, with each other for 20 years. That's also a form of pain. Or whether it's a disease, there's a reason for everything. But the good news is, it's not bad, it's not a punishment really. It's for our benefit and for our good. Hashem loves us, and those who He loves the most, if there is a need, He will rebuke us. He will send us a package of Yesurim, which in the end will benefit us. So continues on, Ashrei Adam Matzah Chochma Ve'adam Yafik Tevuna Happy is the man who finds wisdom and the man who gets understanding. Why? Because one who finds the Chokmah, who studies the Torah, will have a better understanding of why things happen. People complain about the Holocaust and about all sorts of events that are going on today in Israel, which are very difficult to, uh, to grasp, you know, and to, to just have to hear all these terrible things that are going on. But Asher Adam Matzah Chokmah, if you find the Chokmah, if you study the Torah, you're fortunate because you will have more serenity, you will have a better understanding and less concerns as a result in realizing that there is a reason for everything. 
So that in itself is the benefit of Chokhmah, of having a better understanding of why things happen. But Shalomo is also emphasizing Ashrei Adam Matzah Chokhmah because he wants to encourage all those who are contemplating studying other philosophies or embarking on, on other things in life. Life is short. And therefore, spend your time and your effort on what's really important. Chokhmah, the Chokhmah of Hashem, is worth more than anything else. As he, as he continuously throughout the Sefer Mishle extols the value of this great wisdom that this is just not any wisdom and here he goes as I said earlier in a slightly different direction he says the reason why this Chokhmah is so great why it's worth it for you to spend the time and the effort to pursue is Kitov Sahram Mishar Kasef Umeharutz Tevuata for this merchandise is better than the merchandise of silver and its gain is more than that of fine gold he compares it to business this is better than any business because in businesses there are ups and downs you can lose a lot of money in business making a mistake you have nothing to lose here he says this is better than any business this chokhmah, this wisdom you can only gain from it don't you want to spend more time setting aside time to go to a shiur, to a class to acquire more of this knowledge, you can only gain from this, whereas in other businesses the people spend 12, 13 hours a day just trying to make more money and more aggravations all of that has ups and downs, there's no guarantee, it's not something that you can be sure that you will benefit from, as the rabbis tell us, the more possessions, the more worries there are losses there are many things that can go wrong with businesses that this is Kitov Sahra, Mishar Kasef. This Torah, this Chokhmah is better than anything else. And therefore this is what you should pursue more than, any, more than anything else. There's a story in the Midrash of uh, a whole group of people that were traveling by boat. And there was a big storm in the sea. And many of the travelers were businessmen. There was one rabbi there. And they were told by the captain, listen, if you want to survive, we have to throw out over the board all the heavy objects and they felt terrible that they had to throw away their merchandise but that was their only way to survive to make the boat a little bit lighter and they all started throwing their merchandise and then they came over to the rabbi and they said well, where's your merchandise he says my merchandise is over here and he points to his head so they started making fun of him you mean that's merchandise he says yeah my merchandise is more secure than your merchandise and they, they were making fun of him throughout the whole trip. They finally arrived at dry land. And the rabbi, what does the rabbi do? He goes to synagogue, he goes to the Jewish community, he starts giving classes and speeches. They gave him the kavod, the proper respect. They gave him a position. They immediately found him a home. And those guys were naked. They had nothing. No money, no clothing. They lost everything. And they, now they had to beg him, please help us. You know, speak to these people in the community you know, that they should help us. And as a result of his intervention, they were helped. And only then did they admit to him, yes, now we realize that your chokhmah, your wisdom was much more secure than all the money that we have. And no bank, not even the bank in Switzerland, is secure. What you have here in your head is much more secured. That's why Kitov Sahram is Harka said, therefore this merchandise, this chokhmah, is more secure is better, is more valuable than any other business. In Pirkei Avot, there's a very interesting discussion with Rabbi Yossi ben Kisma. Rabbi Yossi ben Kisma arrived in a town and he met an individual, another Jewish individual from this community, and they both greeted each other. And he asks the rabbi, he asks Rabbi Yossi, tell me, where are you from? And Rabbi Yossi answers, I'm from a big city of Chachamim and Sofrim from rabbis and scribes. So the individual turns to the rabbi and tells him, would you agree to live with us? And if you do, I will give you one million golden coins. And precious stones and pearls. Just come and live with us. Even if you gave me all the money, all the precious stones in the world, I will not agree to live only in a place of Torah. So there's some questions over here. Obviously, Rabbi Yosef ben Kisma is talking about the great value of Torah, 
But how does he know from the conversation of this individual, just because the guy is offering him a job and willing to give him such a big salary, how does he know that th- this community does not have Torah? He tells him, I would not accept any money. I'm not willing to trade a place of Torah for money. But who told you that there's no Torah in that place? What, what, where was there any indication from the conversation that that community where that rich man comes from, there's no Torah? You understand the question here? And the answer is, because if Yosef and Kisma realized that the, all the guy was talking about was money, a place that that's all they talk about is money, there's no Torah there. That's all they care about. And this is a very important, there are two very important points here. It's very, very important what parents talk about what they emphasize in their home. Because if parents talk about the importance of making it in life, having a lot of money, accumulating wealth, getting yourself a, a good profession, if, that, if there's a lot of emphasis put on that, on, the, on that which is materialistic, then the children will have similar ideas. And when they are dating, in the dating scene, what do you think they're going to look for? A girl that has money a boy that has money. That's what's going to be on their mind. That is what they heard of. That is what their parents valued. That's what was discussed about. Money, 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 money. And that's what they're going to look for. But if... Yeah. <laughs> there are some cultures, you're right. Yeah. Right, that's what they value, unfortunately. But if at home, if at home the children see that the parents value Talmidei Chachamim, that the parents value Torah, that it's important for the father to go to a shiur Torah, that it's important for an individual to have good nature, good character, that this is what the children hopefully will look for in, in, a, in a partner. Very important what we talk about at home, what do we value. You know, I always try to minimize anything which is materialistic by saying that everything is shtuyot. Nonsense. Anytime somebody brings up something amazing, something attractive, something beautiful, I said shtuyot, it's nonsense. Now obviously everything has some value, but in order to minimize it in their eyes that I don't value these things, that they mean nothing to me, I say it's, it's complete nonsense. Complete shtuyot, don't even mention it to me. I don't even want to hear about these things. But Abba, look at this big car, you know, this latest, newest car with this kind of an engine, doesn't mean anything to me. So what? What are you going to do with it? Try to minimize that which is materialism and elevate that which is more spiritual. Because they, after all, mimic or emulate our ways. As parents, we have this responsibility of what we want to impart on them. Torah values or materialistic values? That is one idea expressed in this uh, part of Pirkei Avot. Another idea is, we move around sometimes. We move from city to city, from community to community, we're looking for a place to live, a place where we can find a good job. How should we decide where to live? Now some people decide depending on where the rent is lower, where the rent, real estate is lower. Obviously that's important. But that should not be the number one uh, condition. Goyim, in the non-Jewish world, I can understand some people looking for, well, I don't want to have to travel to work every day 25 miles. That's reasonable. Some people love their life in the suburbs. But guess what? What's the sacrifice? They're on the freeway one hour, one and a half hours in every direction. Imagine somebody living in Lancaster and having to work in Long Beach. Huh? There are people who do that. They get up at 4 o'clock in the morning, exactly. Or they take the train if there is one. Yeah. But they want, they want the quality life of the suburbs, and I understand them. I would love the choir too. You have to decide. Sometimes you have to be willing to give up something. I'd love to live in Yosemite National Park. It's quiet, there's no traffic. Nature, but there's no mikveh. Maybe in the lake, right? There's no Beit HaKneset, there's no Minyan, there's no Sefer Torah. What are you going to do? A Jew, yeah, <laughs> go to Israel first. <laughs> A Jew is limited of where he could live. Yeah. A Jew is limited of where he can live. A Jew needs a school for his children. He needs a betakneset. The women need a mikveh. So we're limited. So the people who are living in the East Coast, they have to deal with the weather there, in the snow. 
But they want whatever is out there. I don't know what's out there, but they want whatever is out there. <laughs> you know, in the summer it's humid, so they're running away to the mountains. In the winter it's cold, so they run to Miami. They're always running away. <laughs> so I don't know what they're doing there. But anyway, obviously in New York there's a big Jewish center, so that's you know something to reckon with, especially if you made roots there. Where you're going to go? Bezat Hashem will all be going soon to Eretz Israel anyway. <laughs> but in the meantime, you have to make the best of wherever you are. But number one, look for Makom Torah. The children are going to grow up in a place. You can't just go live in Rancho Cucamonga. <laughs> Even though there is a Chabad there. There is a Chabad, but what else is there there? What else? It's a nice place, maybe. But you can't just go live anywhere. Las Vegas is... That's, that's, my next, that's the next point I want to talk about. What about Las Vegas? There was once somebody who asked a rabbi, Rabbi, you know, things are very tough here in Lithuania. Perhaps I sh- we should move to Argentina. This is back then when there was no Jewish community in Argentina. In Argentina we can make some money. And here we, we, we're really, really struggling here. What should we do? There's, there's no Rashaim, there's no wicked people there. It's, they're simple people. But there are no Tzadikim either. In other words, there's no Torah. What should I do? So he asks him, let me ask you, what's preferable? To live in a place where there are wicked and righteous tzaddikim and rashaim, or to live in a place where there are no tzaddikim and no rashaim, just simple people? You tell me, what do you think is better? In a place that has both tzaddikim and rashaim, wicked and righteous, or a place where you, you have neither? A simple place, everybody's simple. He says, I don't know. So the rabbi tells him, it's preferable to live in a place where there's at least one tzaddik. Because you'll be able to look up to someone. You'll be able to learn from someone. That is preferable than a place where there is no tzaddikim at all. Even though there's no rashaim, there's no wicked people. You need a place where there are tzaddikim. So in Las Vegas, I don't think there are too many tzaddikim. <laughs> See? So I wouldn't recommend it. But the community has been growing. So if you're careful and you don't go to the wrong uh, places there, maybe. But I don't think it's a place to raise children. And I think there are much better communities than Las Vegas in the United States. That should not be your first choice. What yes. If somebody is a doctor or some professor that is sent to somewhere, like right? is religious and sent to walk somewhere else, there is no community or something like this, and it's very important. Yeah, if it's temporary, it's fine. But if it's permanent, it's not good. You know, sometimes when you're studying, going through college, you have no choice. You're going to school in a place where there's nothing. But it's temporary. And you have to be very careful that at least you maintain a very rigorous schedule of Torah and Tefillah, that you don't give it up. But it's a big sacrifice. Not everybody is able to withstand the temptations, the challenges. And that is why it was never a favorite profession to be a doctor or to, do, or to be anything that required many years in college. Because you were mixing and mingling with a non-Jewish crowd. And human nature is very weak. It learns. And many people assimilated as a result of mingling too much with the non-Jewish world. You always needed doctors, you always had some doctors. But, you know, today, to become a doctor, to become a lawyer is, is in style. And uh, unless you're going to, to a school which is in a Jewish neighborhood, perhaps, and you're, you're, you're connected continuously to the Jewish community, learning Torah regularly, then that will have a counter-effect of neutralizing any influence you might be getting from the school. But to just be engrossed completely in a non-Jewish environment is very dangerous. No, they send, they, they send their kids away, Chabad, as soon as they're old enough. They don't keep them there long enough, only when they're small. And they hopefully open up a school and bring more people there. And they are, Baruch Hashem, they're a powerhouse. So they're able to attract and to influence, and, and they're very strong. They have a mission. So that's very different. That's not your average person. All right, Shlomo Melech continues on. This merchandise, this Torah, Yekarahi mi peninim, bechor chafatzecha lo yishbubach. This merchandise is better than the merchandise of silver. We said that already. She's more precious than rubies or pearls, and all the things you can desire are not to be compared with her. The reason for that is because any commodity, for example, goes up, goes down, there's something called inflation. So no matter what, in what you invest, you don't know what's going to be, what's going to happen to your investment. 
There's nothing that can compare with the, with the merchandise of Torah. This merchandise also benefits one in this world and in the world to come. Money can only help one perhaps in this world, but as we will see soon, this merchandise can help one in this world and in the world to come. How is that? So he says like this, Orech yamim biminah, bismola osher bechavod. The length of days is in her right hand and in her left hand riches and honor. The right represents Olam Abba. Length of life does not necessarily mean in this world. It means in a world that is eternal, that is the world to come. So the right represents Olam Abba. And the left represents this world. The Torah gives you both. It benefits you in, the, in this world and in the world to come. How does it benefit one in this world? It can give you Orech Yamim. In this world too. Torah is able to lengthen one's life. There are certain mitzvot gulatiyot, certain mitzvot that have uh, something unique powers to them, that if of somebody was supposed to have a short life, but because he was careful with honoring his father and mother, that may lengthen his life. In other words, the Torah protects and lengthens one's life. So that is true even in this world. Even though ordinarily when we say length of life, we're talking about the world to come, which is an, all, which is an eternal world. But there are mitzvot. Tzedakat atzil mimavet. Charity can save one from death. Everybody dies in the end. So what does it mean it saves you? It can protect you from an unnatural death, from an unexpected death, from an, uh, from a, from an early death. But the Torah is even more powerful than the mitzvot. The continuous study of the Torah offers continuous protection in this world. And on the left, there is riches and honor. What's the big deal about riches and honor? We will see later on in chapter Yud, I believe, Perek Asiri, the Shlomo Merak tells us, Birkat Hashem Hita Ashir. It's the blessing of Hashem that really makes one wealthy. If one's wealth comes from Hashem, that is a true blessing. The wealth can come from other sources and he will have headaches, if anything. Not prosperity, not comfort, and he will not enjoy it. So, true Osher Bekavod, the true, don't just be misled and think, oh, wealth, well, I can make a lot of money gambling. No, Osher Bekavod, true Osher Bekavod, comes from Hashem, comes through the power of the Torah. Derachea Darche Noam, that's the next pasuk, V'chol Netivoteha Shalom. Her ways are ways of pleasantness, and all her paths are peace. Judaism as a whole, as a religion, the Torah, does not promote sigufim, Sigufim, how would you say in English, those who... Torture. Not necessarily torture. Those who... There's a word for it. Those who abstain from all the pleasures of life. Ascetics. Ascetics, yeah. Right? Ascetics. Ascetics, I believe it's called. Judaism does not promote that. As opposed to Catholicism, the Torah does promote, and very much encourage, to us to get married and have children. The priests that do not get married, look what has happened to many of them. Right? No need to elaborate. The Torah is not a book or a set of laws that limit limits our lifestyle in a way that is that is very restrictive. The limitations that are in the Torah are for our own benefit to keep us in line. But it's not intended for us to hold ourselves back. We, we are also not supposed to abuse and enjoy all that there is to enjoy without any limits. I mean, there are limits. Kedoshim to you, as we will be reading this week, tells us, sanctify yourself, be holy, even in, the, in those things that are permissible to you. Don't overdo it. I allow you to do certain things, but don't overdo it. So, so Judaism is not a religion of, of limiting yourself from all that Kadosh Baruch created in the world. On the contrary, the rabbis tell us in the Gemara, you're supposed to taste every fruit that Hashem created in this world. To enjoy it, to appreciate it, to make a blessing over it, and not to hold yourself back from that which is permissible. I mean, fast, there's a need for fasting from time to time, but not as a habit. There are many cults who, that is what they preach. In order to be able to elevate yourself, you have to hold yourself back from doing certain things. Torah is against this. Nazir, a Nazir who holds himself back from wine, for a good reason, he's also called a sinner. Nevertheless, he held himself back, and he should not have held himself back. You should be, you should be able to, to acquire or reach self-control or good discipline without having to become a Nazir. Rabbi, yes? 
Shimshon was an exception. He was, it's, it's an exception. He had to be a Shofet. He had a special mission. That was different. But on our own, we should not just hold ourselves back. We may limit ourselves, of course, so we don't overdo it, but not to completely abstain from that which HaKadosh Baruch Hu gave us to enjoy in this world. So therefore, the ways of the Torah are supposed to be pleasant. It's the average way, not the extreme way. All its paths lead to peace. This is a very, very important point. Because Judaism is not a religion that is selfish. In other words, that one does everything just for his own benefit. You will see an emphasis in the Torah to bring peace between husband and wife. To bring peace between two people, two individuals who are uh, arguing about something. All its paths are to promote unity. It's a social religion. It's not just like many cults. Work on yourself to escape reincarnation. The continuous reincarnation as Hinduism and others perhaps teach. In other words, everything you got to do is for yourself. There's an emphasis on the self. No. Kol Tivotea Shalom is for the peace, for the general peace of mankind, and especially amongst the Jews. The idea of Kol Tivotea Shalom, no harm will befall those who follow the Torah, those who perform a mitzvah. You don't have to be concerned that if you eat these foods, you will be unhealthy. If you drink four cups of wine on Pesach, something's going to happen to you. Obviously, if somebody has a high sugar level or a medical problem, then he has to be careful. If he's aware of something, you don't go against that. You don't rely on miracles. But otherwise, you don't have to be concerned to think, you know, oh, what's going to happen if I do this? You know, if it's a mitzvah, the Torah instructs you to do something, all its ways, all, all, all its paths lead to peace. No michshol. One will not stumble as a result of following it, the Torah of, of performing a mitzvah. Another idea of why he says kol nativotea shalom is that when people go on a business venture, try to make some money, they're taking risks sometimes. They may be even endangering their lives. They may be audited. They may, they may, they may get into trouble. You never know. Wrong, wrong partners, one has associated himself with somebody. This has happened. And the guy was caught for drugs. And they looked at his uh, telephone book, and they saw the guy, uh, this, the, all these people's names. And they go after them too. You're on this guy's telephone book, so you must be his friend. You know, Anything can go wrong in business, but not in the Torah. The Torah protects one from all mikhsholim. Kol Tivotea Shalom, the Torah does not believe in extremism, as we said before. And it is not an extremist religion. The reason I add this is because some people might be taken aback when they read about the mitzvah of Mehiyat Amalek, of destroying Amalek, even the children, even the animals. If you go a little bit in deeper into the reasons behind the mitzvah, you will see the great importance of that mitzvah and why it's not extremist. When we slaughter an animal, shahita, to some in Switzerland and in Holland and in Denmark, that appears to be cruel. They don't want. They don't want a Jew to slaughter an animal in those countries. But in reality, if you look deep into the mitzvah and you pay close attention to what is happening to the animal, that is the best way to, to slaughter the animal. Through the shahita, through severing the food pipe and the wind pipe. Torah has many mitzvot that show compassion. Otobet beno, you cannot slaughter a, a cow and its calf on the same day. What for? What are, are we concerned about the feelings of the cow? There, is, there are many mitzvot in the Torah that you will see that are meant to instill in us compassion. Rahamim. So the Torah is not a religion of extremism. On the contrary, if you pay close attention to, the, to where it is leading us, it's all to shalom, to peace. What is that? The shiloh haken. is also a different idea. Alright, let's go on. Adonai v'chokhmah yasad aretz konen shamayim bitvuna. Hashem by His wisdom has founded the earth, or established the earth, and by understanding He has established the heavens. The idea here is that the entire world is actually created with chokhmah. This chokhmah that is found in the Torah can really be found in all of creation. The entire universe is created with chokhmah. The entire universe was created with the Torah. 
If you pay attention, if you look at all the details, everything is with great chokhmah, with great wisdom. Bedaato tehomot nifkaush hakimir afutal. By his knowledge, the depths were broken up and the clouds dropped down dew. That's the uh, basic translation. What does that mean, bid'ato? By his knowledge, it is through Hashem's continuous supervision and knowledge and awareness that he determines what will happen down on this earth. He did not just create the earth and leave. What happens in this world, whether it's a calamity, a natural disaster somewhere, whether there's a lack of rain, an abundance of rain, it's bid'ato. It's through his wisdom, through his awareness, through his knowledge. In other words, there's a reason for everything. There are rules to how life is supposed to conduct itself down here. So Hashem responds according to how human beings behave. Everything is done with His knowledge. My son, do not depart. Do not allow yourself to depart from the Torah, that your eyes do not depart from them. And keep sound wisdom and discretion. Shlomo Melech is telling us that even though, even though I emphasize to you, let me go back before we, we before we get into this pasuk. Let me go back to uh, another pasuk that we skipped. Etz chaim hila machazikim bach v'tomechei ameushar. We skipped this pasuk. She's a tree of life to those who lay a hold on her, and happy is everyone who holds her fast. It's a famous pasuk. Etz chaim hila machazikim bach. This is a tree of life to those who support it. There are many who do not have the time to learn as much Torah. Not everybody becomes a rabbi. So there's an emphasis here on supporting Torah, supporting rabbis. The famous example is Issachar and Zebulun, the two children of Yaakov. Issachar was a learner. Zebulun went out to the seas. He liked to do business overseas. He was always traveling, did not have the time. They made a deal. Zebulun tells Issachar, listen, you're learning. You love to learn. Let me pay you, let me support you and your family and the Torah that you learn should be also my share. Should it, I should also have a share, a part in your Torah. And that is completely permissible and encouraged in the Halakha. Whoever wants to do that can do that. And he receives, he receives a share in the Torah of that individual who's learning. Not everybody has all the time to learn it. So this is encouraged. It's Haimila Machazekimba, it's also tree of life to those who support it, the Tomechea Meushar. Those who uphold it are also fortunate. There's another idea behind the Mahazikimba. Mahazikimba does not only mean those who learn it and those who support it. It also means that if one is if, if one is able to, he should give the job to a Talmud Chacham if that Talmud Chacham has a business instead of someone else, because that Talmud Chacham perhaps needs the money. If you have a choice of giving the job to a, a Jew or to a non-Jew, and they're both equally good, give it to the Jew. You have an obligation to support your brothers first. It is the right thing to do is to support the Talmud Chacham first. La sot pragmatia la Talmud Chacham, as the rabbis tell us. To allow him to do business. If he needs some money, help him out first. So it's haimi la mahazikimba, meaning to those who are able to support financially through a business deal, not necessarily to just support him, but even if he has a business, a shop, give him the help. That is also called la Mahazikimbah. And that leads us to the other pasuk, which we skipped before we, we got to that, we skipped that other pasuk. My son, therefore, even if you are supporting others, that's what Shalom Melech is putting an emphasis over here, even if you are supporting Talmidei Chachamim, your eyes should not drift away from the Torah. You yourself have a responsibility to learn halakha. You have to know how to keep Shabbat. It's very nice and beautiful, and it's the correct thing to do is to support Amidei Chacham if you don't have the time. But al yaluzu me'inecha netzor tu shiyam zima. You yourself set aside some time and put your eyes on the Torah so that you know the basics. It doesn't exempt one from, knowing, from, from learning at all. It's important to support because you don't have the time. All right, you'll have a share in his Torah. But you have to learn yourself something. Netzor tu shiyom zima means that not only should you adapt all the good character that is being discussed in the Torah that one should have, but also the fulfillment of the mitzvot. Some Jews like to claim, well, I have a good heart. I'm a Jew at heart. 
that's beautiful, but the Torah requires ma'asim too, action. Just to be a nice person is not enough. You have to fulfill the mitzvot. Netzor to shia. Umzima. The Torah is called to shia because it gives us strength. Umzima, direction. To know what to do. So it's not enough just to support. It's not enough just to adapt the beautiful qualities. It's important to apply everything that needs to be applied and to fulfill the mitzvot. Judaism is a religion of action, not just of certain behaviorisms. There should be a life to your neshama and a grace to your neck. And what that means is that if you take the Torah seriously, if this is your life, if this is important to you, then you will find grace and favor in other people's eyes. People will accept you. If you say something to them, if you rebuke, if you rebuke them, they will listen to you. Why? Because you're practicing what you preach. If a person talks about something and he doesn't practice it, if it doesn't mean so much to him, his words will have no effect. This is like your life. If this means to you so much, like your life, then the henle gargeroteha, then it will be a grace. In other words, it will find grace. It will be effective to others. It will stand out. People will accept it. Then you shall walk in your way safe, safely and, you should, and your foot should not stumble. And this is also a very important point that the more one learns Torah, the more one conducts himself according to the ways of Torah, he can rest assured that no harm will befall him. His bitachon, his faith and reliance in HaKadosh Baruch Hu will become stronger and he will have, he will have no worries what to be concerned about. He will be able to walk and go and do what he's doing without being concerned. This is a, another, one may say this is an additional reward for the physical body in this world. We spoke about the reward in Olam Abba. We spoke about how the Torah protects one in this world, how one benefits from the Torah. This is an additional reward where one is, is protected from any harm whatsoever. He can go in peace. He can rest assured that everything will be okay with him because he's doing everything right. However, what happens when things go wrong, when things do turn out to be not too good? So we said that in the very beginning. If Yisurim come, then those who are knowledgeable in the Torah will understand that they are for, their, for one's benefit. Anyone who has true bitachon Bashem knows that no individual, no human being in this world can do you any harm unless Hashem decreed so. You can't put yourself in danger. Human beings have free will. And if you don't have enough merits, you're going to get into trouble. But otherwise, if you mind your own business, and you don't step on anybody's toes, right? You follow the Torah, you, there's no reason for you to be concerned. And if something does happen, then what does the Bitachon teach? It's Minash Shemaim. It's for my own benefit. Nothing happens for no reason. That is why those who have Bitachon are more serene. They're more in peace. People still have worries. But they immediately put their worries aside because they realize that the, this is Omen HaShemayim. You can only worry about something you, you, you can do something about. Why worry about something you have no control about? If there's nothing you can do, then why worry about it? Leave it to Hashem. If you can do something about something, if you can really have a say in something, make a difference, then obviously you want to worry about it because you want to make the right decision. But even then, put your trust in Hashem. Anyone who therefore follows the Torah will not stumble. Not only when you're awake, but even when you go to sleep, when you lie down, you should not be afraid. You should sleep, and your sleep shall be sweet. And what does that mean? That even one's dreams will be good dreams. Even when one goes to sleep, he will not have any worries. A person who does not follow the Torah, who does not have bitachon Bashem, you know what one problem may be? He's envious of others. He can't go to sleep because he's not at peace with himself. I just lost the deal. That guy just double-crossed me. You know, people really are hurt. People really are bothered by all sorts of things that happen in, during the day. This guy goes to sleep quietly. You know, as I remember, a rabbi once told a story of an individual who took a big loan and he just couldn't pay it back and uh, he, w he, w he wasn't able to go to sleep so easily because it was always on his mind one night his wife sees him agonizing and she says why should you lose sleep over it let the guy who you owe money lose sleep over it 
you go to sleep. That's what he says over here. Im tishkav lo tifchad. If one is truly botach uh, b'shem, truly relying on the kadosh baruch hu, there's no reason why he has to have any concerns. You can go to sleep. Varvash natech. You can have sweet dreams. And according to the Kabbalah, depending on his actions during the day, his neshama can go higher and higher in the heavens at night. And the higher the neshama goes at night, the more he can see with clarity. His dreams are clearer and his dreams are truer, not nonsense. So the Torah does not only protect one during the day while he's awake, but even at night it can make a big difference. How does a person go to sleep? Falls asleep after seeing TV, listening to the radio, reading a paper? Or imagine going to sleep after reading Tehillim or Mishnayot or something else, falling asleep from that. Or even if he didn't sl- fall asleep on the Sefer, but he went to sleep immediately after that. It makes a tremendous difference. So not only during the day, but even at night, the Torah makes a difference. Be not afraid of sudden fear, nor of the ruin of the wicked when it comes. If anybody has to be afraid, it's the Rishayim who are in peace and tranquility. If they are true sinners, then things can turn around just overnight. There's a story of, uh, of a Jew who was Mechalel Shabbat. He used to have his factory opened on Shabbat. And the Chafetz Chaim heard about it and came to him and told him, close the Shabbat, close the, the factory on Shabbat, because otherwise you may lose your entire factory. The Torah says so. And he says, you think, Rabbi, that one pasuk in the Torah can can change my mind, can, uh, can make a difference in my life. I need to run this place all the time. Every day costs me a fortune. So, but the Chafetz Chaim warned, listen, there's no beracha. You can lose everything just like that. It's just like that. I don't, I don't accept that. Just because you say that, that, the, that the Torah says that there will be no blessing, that is not enough for me to close the shop. I, I don't see that happening to me. But unfortunately, Soon after this incident, the Russian government went in and confiscated, I think it was the communists, confiscated all the private owned factories. And the guy barely made it out alive. He saved his skin and he came to the Chafetz Chaim and he admitted, he said, I guess the Shabbat can take away one's entire fortune if one is not careful with her. People make these silly mistakes, don't realize that that they don't have full control. And if Hashem decides it's gone, it's gone. So who has to be concerned? Mipachat bitom, only Rashaim. You do not have to be fearful. Al tiram mipachat bitom, one who walks in the ways of the Torah. Umishoat Rashaim kitavo. There's a story about one who, who passed away and came in a dream to, his, to the rabbi, I think it was, of the community. And he says, as long as I was alive and I read Tehillim every day, this community was protected. But now there's nobody learning Torah, nobody reading Tehillim. You guys are exposing yourself to an imminent danger. We, what we see from this is the importance of, of learning Torah. That if one learns Torah, it offers protection to himself, to his family, to his household, and perhaps even to the entire community. One who, who does not, Halila, has to be concerned that things may happen. Things may go wrong. Yes? What you just said, Rabbi, and the Jews of Gush Katif who are learning in yeshivas and synagogues there should have no fear whatsoever that they, that they would have, they would be in any... Right, they don't have to be afraid, but they have to do whatever they need to do, and that is to pray to Hashem. When things happen that are not to our liking, it could be that Hashem is testing us. What are we going to do about it? How strong do we feel about something? Are we going to give up easily or fight for it? That's all it is. It's a nisayon. A very important point is being stressed over here, not to be afraid of human beings. But to, to, to yes be afraid of one's sins, so the Kim are concerned not about problems, but about their sins. That yes, but not about other things. As the Midrash tells us about a big tzaddik who was once found sleeping in the fields. And somebody came over to him and said, aren't you afraid of the animals? Aren't you afraid of sleeping in the, uh, in the open? He says, I'm embarrassed to be afraid of something else other than Hashem. How could I be afraid of something else other than Hashem? I would be better. I have no fears of sleeping outside. One therefore has to always ask himself, what is he afraid of more? A thief, according to the Torah, pays double. Why? Because he's more afraid of human beings. That is why he steals at night. A highway robber, 
In other words, in the open, he's not afraid, no, not of God and not of human beings. He does it in the open. So he only pays for what he stole. A thief pays double. You're more afraid of human beings than you are of God who told you not to steal. One always has to ask himself, what is he more afraid of? People sometimes don't do sins because they're embarrassed. People are going to find them, discover them. And that's a shame. One should be much more concerned and afraid of what Hashem thinks of him. Not what Uncle Sam or what the nations of the world will say if you do the right thing. Ki Hashem That is the last pasuk here. Ki Hashem yeh bechislecha v'shamar aglecha milachet Let me see it here in the English. For Hashem shall be your confidence and shall keep your foot from being caught. And what that means is that since we do not rely on our wealth and on our strength, we rely on Hashem. In Hashem's confidence, we have nothing to fear. Only a, a wicked man has what to fear because he can get caught because of the way he believes. He believes in his strength, but not we. We believe in Akadosh Baruch Hu. Milechet from being caught also means that the one can be caught as a result of uh, making a mistake in uh, expressing an opinion in Halakha. One who follows the Torah should not be concerned. Akadosh Baruch Hu will protect him that he should not stumble or make a mistake in Halakha. A tzaddik who is careful with the mitzvot does not have to be concerned that he will do an avera unintentionally. Hashem will protect him from milechet, from being caught in an avera. And milechet also means from being hurt by the mazikim, by the demons. In other words, the Torah offers protection against all evils. And one who follows the Torah does not have to be concerned milechet, from being caught, from stumbling in any way at all. Mikesel, mikesel also means... Bechislecha also means, even in those areas that you are naive, kesil. Hashem ye bechislecha, in those things that you are naive and unaware of, even in those areas, Hashem will protect you, that you will not make any mistakes. Bechislecha also means, bechislecha, the commentaries say. If you give your money away for tzedakah, for good causes, Hashem will make sure that your money will not go to unnecessary causes, like to pay extra taxes, tickets being caught by the police for speeding, you should not speak too much either, but uh, for tickets that you would not have had to pay had your money gone to tzedakah. So what he's saying is, Bekis lecha. Hashem will protect your pocketbook if you use it properly. You use your tzedakah, use your money for good causes. Otherwise it ends up going to all these other causes that are not as important. And as a final note, what Shlomo Melech is reminding us over here is that the more a person lives his life according to the Torah, the more he will see the Hashgaha Gluya, Hashgaha Berura, the more he will see the, cl the clear divine providence in every walk of his life, in his Parnassah, in his family, in Shiduchim, in every area. You will see, one will see actual miracles that at first perhaps one did not understand, but in the end, when one is able to look back and see how everything comes together, everything will make sense to him. And that is what we're waiting for. We're waiting for Mashiach to come because then we will understand that everything that has transpired over us made a lot of sense. Bezat Hashem, it should happen very soon.